Jeremiah Tower has been one of the most influential yet controversial figures in the history of American gastronomy. In addition to turning the food world on its head with California cuisine and an emphasis on local ingredients, the introduction of open kitchens and having the bar serve as the heart of the restaurant rather than a waiting room. Lydia Tanaya tells his story, the, the story of his remarkable life in her film called Jeremiah Tower, The Last Magnificent. It opens tomorrow at the Sunshine Cinema. And joining us now live from WMYC's Green Space are Lydia Tanaya, chef, author, and television personality Anthony Bourdain, and Jeremiah Tower himself. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Nice and, to be here. And Anthony, uh, should I have added executive producer and publisher to your list? Yeah, well, I, I, I do those things, yes. <laughs> because Jeremiah's book, now I only have an early uh, release of it, called Start the Fire, How I Began a Food Revolution in America. It's just been published by Echo under your imprint? Yes. Are you publishing other food privilege. books? Uh, not just food books. Uh, people with uh, strong and unique voices from you know uh, any genre. Jeremiah, is this a brand new book, or have, is this a revised version of, of your famous earlier book? It's a revised version of California Dish, but it's got about you know 40% new material, new introduction, um, and a new take. And I, this one's better prose. I had <laughs> took a long time to edit it. <laughs> well, I had a sense that you had good prose from the start. Well, I think That's you. part thank of your you. upbringing, uh, the story that is told in this film. Right. And the, you say in the film that you think it's important people know the names of the people who changed the world. Is that why you signed on as executive director, or producer of this one? Well, I, I brought the project in. I read, uh, I, I, I'd of course, uh, as a working cook and chef for many years, uh, I'd heard the name Jeremiah Tower spoken, spoken in admiring terms by uh, various chefs I met. Uh, but it really wasn't until I read uh, his memoir that I became really interested in well, I was angry. I felt a sense of uh, historical injustice that needed to be corrected, and I wanted it. I was, I was intrigued and fascinated that so many of the things I take it for granted as being just sort of part of the language of American cooking that I'd been doing it, it in fact come from Jeremiah, and I had no idea. And the extent to which he'd been written out of history uh, angered me, and I, I brought the project to uh, Lydia, my uh, creative, long-time creative uh, partner at uh, Zero Point Zero, uh, whose company makes Parts Unknown, and to CNN, and we started to put together this uh, fascinating uh, story about an incredible time and an incredible artist. How much did you know about Jeremiah when you started, Lydia? I had heard his name once, uh, actually, and it was a long time ago. Um, it was in a conversation with Ruth Reichel, who was actually in the film, um, and she had mentioned him and her time in Berkeley. Um, but I hadn't really known much about him, uh, you know, until Tony read the memoir, and then he gave it to me, and then I read it. And, you know, it was fascinating to read about such a character who had, you know, such an incredible impact on the culinary landscape, um, yet I didn't even know his name, and I've been working in food television for a long, long time. You think this is a generational thing? Yeah, because, I mean, I th I, I've always known about Jeremiah Tower because I read, I, unfortunately I didn't eat at Chez Panisse until after you'd left, right. but I, I'd heard about you, and then of course Stars, your famous mm -hmm. restaurant in, Los, in San Francisco. Right. I, I don't want to. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but but to some extent, <laughs> he is. there I am a conspiracy theorist. Uh, to some extent, uh, year after year, uh, largely because Jeremiah wasn't around, uh, he was he was written out of history knowingly by people who knew better what had happened, who was responsible, what 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 the the, the question of true authorship uh, really was, and and I think uh, he became an inconvenient man. And so it's not just generational. His name was kept alive by professional chefs, but he was not a name on everyone's lips uh, in the increasingly foodie universe, and he, and he deserved to be. In in the film, I was struck by the sheer audacity of chutzpah that you displayed. You, for instance, applying for a chef position at Chez Panisse, even though right. you'd had no experience other than hosting dinner parties for friends, and later selecting a, a dirty, rundown area as the site of your rather expensive restaurant in, in San Francisco Stars. Um, is it, was part of it just going against the, the norm? 
Well, it helps to have, you know, had very little money at the time. So I chose an area that, for two reasons, one, nobody else wanted it, and two, because it was next to the ballet, symphony, opera, the museum, the politicians, the courts, the lawyers, and I thought, you know, I was quite aware that if we opened there, we could get an audience before 7 o'clock and after 10 o'clock. But didn't people warn you about the... The alley oh. that they had to walk down to get oh, when I took you know uh, people like Bruce Rogel, but James Beard standing in the in the ruin that was this site, this old Italian restaurant, with rats running across his feet, and he was swiping them with his cane. He said, "Jeremiah, this is a disaster." <laughs> <laughs> I went. I didn't see any disaster. All I saw was you know the finished product. Looking at that space, well, obviously the restaurant was a success, so people got past the right. disaster. Where does the title come from, Lydia? The Last yeah. Magnificent. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, there's a, a, a quote in the, the book. Actually, there was an article written by this um, well-known journalist, James Villas, and he had written this piece on Lucius Beebe, who was one of Jeremiah's, uh, you know, heroes, I right, guess. Right. He was a bon vivant, um, a, a man who sort of single-handedly uh, created the idea of cafe society, so um, there, there was a, a quote from B.B., you know, talking about wanting to be sort of this man about town and, you know, on the avenues and sort of hobnobbing with the social elite and et cetera. And he's described as the last magnificent. When I heard that, I thought, you know, that seemed to be a fitting title for the Kicked film. out of Harvard, or, was it Harvard or Yale, for showing up Both. stone drunk every morning in a top hat? Yeah. yeah. Is that what you aspire to, John? No, well, I lost my top hat a long time ago, <laughs> but, and I never had a cane. But, you know, he, he, there was a phrase that he said that, um, because he was very, very fancy, he had a private railroad car, and he was very rich and all that sort of thing. So, um, but he said, you know, a day is not bad if it ends with, you know, someplace with a hot bird and a cold bottle. So I took that as roast chicken and butter maraché. He got my vote. <laughs> and, and drinking champagne was a major Well, that's just part. the beginning. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's how you start the day. <laughs> Based on your description of your childhood, clearly your first major accomplishment was just surviving. Looking yes. back, are you surprised that you did? Well, if, first of all, if I'd known what it was to be a chef, I would have run like hell down Shattuck Avenue in, in Berkeley. Oh, I was thinking more from... about, for example, when the film opens with a, a reenactment of a scene oh. from your childhood where you spent an entire day on the beach in Australia and your parents never noticed that you were gone. Um, <clears throat> you, that's when you say you realize you better learn to care for yourself. And then there's that story where your parents were, you join your parents in a dining room and they ask you, what are you doing here? Well, of course, I mean, I was enjoying that huge hotel. It was in London in the 50s. There was a, such a great uh, pea soup fog outside. There was nobody around. So I was used to eating in this vast dining room uh, with, you know, all the waiters around my table, sm slicing smoked salmon, spooning out caviar uh, alone. You know, I thought it was great theater. Mm -hmm. But I've list been listening to Tony, and I was <laughs> the way it's... The way it happened and the way it's been described, <clears throat> excuse me, would now be seen as child abuse. But actually, at the time, uh, it seemed like a lot of fun to me. Even so, I'm sure I sort of put aside all the negative feelings and brought them out uh, to become a chef. Well, your parents were very wealthy, and th this gave you access to all these things. But uh, did you start thinking about cooking when you were invited into the kitchens of some of these great hotels? Oh no, absolutely not. I mean, uh, I didn't want I didn't want to be in those kitchens, you know. I, I wanted to be on the other side. I wanted to be out in the dining room being served. Um I became a chef by accident. So, I mean, I I was on my way to Hawaii to do underwater architecture and I ran out of money in San Francisco and you my You trained as an architect. Yes. But I was a lousy architect, so I couldn't, you know, couldn't get a job. Uh, you could have certainly nobody. You could have worked for the Alfred Portali. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sorry, that's an in joke. Sorry. That's an in joke, by yeah. the way. <laughs> Alfred Portali is famous for serving food that vertical food. <clears throat> yeah, which I always, I mean, I love Alfred, but I hated vertical food because I mean he doesn't do it anymore. It ends up in your neighbor's lap if you're, you know, <laughs> and that's when you're lucky. 
What is so it? you were going to Hawaii. I'm sorry. Sorry, I ran out of money. And my uh, roommate at college, who was in the interviews in the, in the film, uh, said he and his wife, who was a great cook, said you should answer that ad. Here's an ad in, in the newspaper. A little place in Berkeley called Chez Panisse is looking for an executive chef who is familiar with the philosophy, if there was one, with Elizabeth David and Fernand Point. And I thought, Elizabeth David hated Fernand Point. What are they talking about? <laughs> I thought, but maybe they don't know that. So maybe I've got an in, you know. So I went over and fi fixed the soup and got a job, which shows you how desperate I was <laughs> and how desperate they were. And proceeded to change the world. <laughs> I'm speaking with Jeremiah Tower, who's the subject of a new film called Jeremiah Tower, The Last Magnificent, that will open tomorrow at the Sunshine Cinema down in, uh, on Houston Street. Uh, also with us are Lydia Tenaya, who made the film, and Anthony Bourdain, who appears in it and who also was the executive producer of it, and probably the, the reason the film got made in the first place. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so you get, you get a job at Chez Panisse, which was already a pretty popular restaurant, wasn't it? No, what? it was pretty much unknown. It was only Did a year they know old. that you were not trained at all? I said they were desperate. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony, you're uh, a graduate of Culinary Institute of America, a veteran of numerous professional kitchens. Are you surprised uh, that he was able to do what he did, considering his background? It, it, no, because particularly in those times, uh, cooking was done by misfits, outcasts, losers, dreamers, crackpots, romantics. The, like you. The refuse. <laughs> yeah. But, but uh, you know, I was able, I, I too sort of stumbled into the restaurant business. Uh, I started as a dishwasher. Unlike uh, Jeremiah, I was not a creative genius or an innovator, and I banged around in the business in a very workmanlike way for a lot of years. Um, but I you think did this well was, enough. You developed well, a it, reputation. Uh, you know my name because of books, not because of my cooking career. Um, but I think, you know, it was a magical time. It was a miraculous a confluence of forces. It was an environment that allowed uh, this extraordinary man who'd grown up reading these menus and experiencing this food with a gen and cooking these dishes in his dorm room at Harvard. Um, to, to, to do amazing things, which, which is what he did. He started cooking not just food, but writing menus, extraordinary menus that really changed the whole landscape. So let's talk about those menus. Well, first of all, you, don't chefs usually start off with ingredients? You, you were starting off with menus. No, uh, ingredients are the beginning and middle and end of, of it all I mean, uh, in the restaurant. But I was inspired by, in those days, it, I mean, it sounds absolutely ludicrous to, now, um, but there were hardly any good ingredients around when we first started. Um, we had to go look for them. I mean, somebody banged on the back door of the kitchen one evening and said, I have some mushrooms from the Berkeley Hills. And everyone, that, uh, you know, other people said, well, no, you can't use those. They could be poisonous. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, have you eaten any of these? He said, of course, they're delicious. I said, fine, bring them in. Now bring in whatever mushrooms you find. There was a, uh, a boat boy who you were allowed when you came back on the trolling boats, you, whatever fish they caught, they could keep. So they, he knocked on the door one evening, and there was a beautiful big salmon in rigor mortis still. And cut a long story short, he ended up opening the biggest fish company in, in the Bay Area, you know, and supplied all the restaurants, including Stars. So the word went out, this guy will, you know, buy anything. <laughs> Someone, then, someone brought a moray eel, not a moray, a conger eel to the back door, and I said, fantastic, tomorrow we serve bouillabaisse. Now, this is before New York restaurants started going to the Union Square Market and finding their ingredients. <laughs> from... This is before any farmer's no. market. Well, there was a, a, a San Francisco farmer's market, mm. mostly Asian. So, Chez Panisse had begun as a kind of a tribute to... Uh, French bistro, and you, you decided to start using local ingredients and then also incorporating Fran I mean, California wines. Uh, your background would suggest that you would have been a wine snob and only insisted on French wines. Well, that was true, but I couldn't tell the public that, for heaven's sakes. You know, we were in California. <laughs> no, what happened was, in 1970, I was cooking uh, festival menus for, around France, for all the regions of France. We ran out of the regions, so finally there was only one left, which was Corsica, 
I mean, I didn't even know what Corsica was, let alone, you know, what the food was. So that, that was the first really terrible meal that I cooked. Uh, and so the next day I thought, well, I'm, you know, I can't do this again. Um, that was no fun, you know, serving something I didn't like to 100 people. So I thought, I just had the moment, why am I beating myself to death over this, trying to find, you know, stockfish in Oakland? Uh, so I said, okay, I just had that moment. Wait a minute, why not just... Sell? We've got these wonderful things now by 76. The prawns from Monterey Bay, uh, the Charlie Sol. Uh, you know, I had some geese that I was raising in Sonoma, you know, to make cassoulet. So I just wrote the California Regional Dinner in 1976. And all in it, English, all California wines, mm-hmm. and naming the uh, sources for the first time. And the impact of was Tectonic. almost immediate? Tectonic. Everybody started imitating. Everybody, everybody freaked out. It was an absolutely revolutionary act to proudly attribute uh, menu items and ingredients specifically to uniquely American locations and sources. Huge, and, and paired with American wines. Uh, not only did uh, diners like it, but it was national news in the food press, and, and literally, you know, every menu is like that almost. But but that then back then it was a bold and hugely influential statement. We have a clip from the film. Should we watch it? Oh yeah, yes. Yeah. Most people would not know who Jeremiah Tower is. And sadly, he certainly is considered, in my book anyway, a father of the American cuisine. Due in the 80s and early 90s, Jeremiah Tower was one of the major names in this country. He was on the front of magazines. He was known all over Europe. The very first thing I heard about after I heard about Chez Panisse was Jeremiah Tower. He was the darling, the glamour puss, the sexy guy, the smart guy, and the innovative chef that became something that was what everyone wanted to know about. In the 70s, Alice Waters opens Chez Panisse. You cannot begin to understand the impact on the food landscape. 1972, Jeremiah Tower walks into Chez Panisse. Everyone reluctantly or not have to agree that he put the place on the map. Jeremiah Tower's menus made Chez Panisse the place that everybody wanted to go complete reevaluation of, of not just American food and ingredients, but food. That was a little clip from the film. Now you probably recognize some of those voices, Martha Stewart, Mario Batali, Ruth Reichel, and Anthony Bourdain, who is with us here, along with Lydia Tenaya, who is the director of a film called Jeremiah Tower, The Last Magnificent, which opens tomorrow at the Sunshine Cinema. And we are fortunate to have the subject of the film here as well, Jeremiah Tower. And we will continue right after this. We're broadcasting live from WMIC's Green Space. Our Food Friday series for the spring starts tomorrow. And for this season, we'll be diving into the world of dinner parties. And we want to hear from our listeners. Do you throw dinner parties or have you always wanted to throw one but just haven't gotten up the nerve to do it yet? We would love to hear from you. So write to us on a... Facebook or Twitter or email us at foodfridays at WMIC.org. Listen to WMIC and WMIC.org. WNYC is supported by Alchemies, the maker of Vivitrol, now Trexone, for extended release injectable suspension. More information available at vivitrol.com. Open Road, presenting the new film, The Promise, a story of love, tragedy, and triumph set during the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, starring Oscar Isaac and Christian Bale, in theaters tomorrow. WNYC is a media partner of Governor's Ball Music Festival, a music and arts festival inspired by New York City's eclectic spirit. Performances by Franz Ferdinand, Bleachers, Parquet Courts, and more, June 2nd through 4th at Randall's Island Park. GovBall.com. A small-town lawyer's mother prodded him into taking on pharmaceutical distributors. She made some offhand comment to the, to the rest of the family that somebody in our community should do something about it. And uh, that's when my, one of my brothers looked at me and said, isn't that what you do for a living? I'm Kelly McEvers, how West Virginia counties are going after one link in the deadly opioid chain. This afternoon on All Things Considered. Weekday, starting at 4 on WNYC. 
WNYC, independent journalism in the public interest. 93.9 FM and AMA 20, NPR News and the New York Conversation. Today on Fresh Air, Terry Gross talks with New York Times White House correspondent Maggie Haberman about covering President Trump, his White House, the leaks, the tweets. She has been on the Trump beat for the New York newspapers since the early 2000s. That's today at 2 on 93.9 FM. And we are back with Jeremiah Tower, who is the subject of a new film called Jeremiah Tower, The Last Magnificent, which opens tomorrow at the Sunshine Cinema. Also with us are Lydia Tenaya, who made the film, and Anthony Bourdain, who's the executive producer of it, and also uh, somebody who obviously admires Jeremiah Tower a lot. And he has also uh, put together, put uh, Jeremiah Tower's uh, book, Start the Fire, How I Began a Food Revolution in America, out under his imprint. Uh, that is um, the Anthony Bourdain books under Echo. Yes. And uh, is this book out already? Uh, it is yes. out. Yes. Yes, it is out. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. In bookstores yes. everywhere. It is out, yeah. Now, Lydia, how did you get that footage of Chez Panisse Kitchen? Uh, it's just fascinating stuff. Yeah, no, it's funny because, you know, as we went into our deep archival uh, research, there was sort of little that was coming up during that time frame that we could use and access. Um, and years ago, I had worked on a project with Ruth Rachel um, about her time in uh, Berkeley, and she had mentioned this film, Garlic is as Good as Ten Mothers by Les Blank, famous documentary filmmaker. She said, you know, that she uh, had participated in that film, and I had sort of dug around. This was a long time ago, and I had found this tiny little 10-second clip of Ruth, you know, back in the day, back in her Berkeley years. Um, and so I, we started to look into that. Uh, Les has passed away. His son manages the estate. We talked to him. He said, listen, I can't, I can't license the, the, the film, the, the actual film footage to you, but... We have all the outtakes from the film. Would you like to see that? <laughs> and I, yes. I mean, you know, it was just one of, moments, it was one of those moments. It's one of those happy, happy funnier. accidents where you know he very wonderfully and accommodatingly um, transferred uh, a, a good bulk of the outtakes from the film, and that's that's what we were able to use during that period. And Jeremiah, were you aware that they were filming uh, the kitchen at that time? This was. Uh, Les was around a couple of times. I think it was on the third birthday or something of Chez Panisse. Uh, but we had to ask him to stop filming because somebody, for the first time anyone had ever seen it, introduced a half a pound of cocaine on top of the freezer Ooh. in the back of the kitchen. <laughs> so that film, film sort of came to an end. <laughs> But this was later. The that I'd filming be interested in seeing that. those outtakes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, no, I think somebody burned them. <laughs> and then you left Chez Panisse and opened Stars, which became a big success. And there's a lot of footage from Stars as well because it became a celebrity hangout. Was that when the, the phrase "celebrity chef" was kind of invented? I don't know when that first appeared, but Anthony, you know that. It, look, it. it it wasn't even a concept then. It was an unimaginable uh, thing. Well, there were famous French chefs. Yeah, but, but they, um, they were not mentioned in the same way as movie stars. They were, they were uh, esteemed, they were well-known, they were looked up to, uh, they were local heroes of a sort, but they were not celebrities. And this, uh, this was something very, either of those things, very, very new to America. Jeremiah was the first chef who the customers wanted and demanded to see in the dining room. They needed to see him there. So you was, came out of the kitchen. Well, right. It was an open kitchen. An open kitchen. Yes, it was an open kitchen. And um, then you came out and you would go from table to table. Right, right. And now that seems, sometimes I would prefer the chef not to come to my table. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, and you, you know, given the story of Manhattan, and what you're saying, would you bring me my cocktail, please? Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> but, you know, there was a, in the 80s, late 80s, Time magazine said that I'd had more uh, publicity than Meryl Streep. Mm -hmm. Rightly or wrongly, I'm not sure. But the point was, how could a cook get the same kind of amount of publicity as a movie star? You know, however, for whatever reason, the fact is that, that uh, as annoying as the celebrity chef phenomenon might be, 
that the, this, this thing that, that Jeremiah created or became caused a power shift. It made chefs interesting. It made chefs worth listening to. It gave them the power to suggest to their customers or to tell their customers, look, this is what I'm good at. This is the food that I love. You know, maybe you think you'd like a steak with, you know, uh, potatoes on, on, but I'm, I feel I'm particularly good at this and I'd like you to try it. That shift in power, uh, that, that assignment of the idea that the chef could be interesting and worth talking to and worth listening to uh, really opened the door for, for, for so many other creative people. Was there pressure on you to keep on coming up with new things? Yes, but I mean also that's what I love doing because that's mm -hmm. what inspired me and what kept the restaurant going. Because I, I had a friend who had a wonderfully successful restaurant and she would want to change things all the time and then even uh, a famous uh, reviewer came in and said, why isn't whatever it is on yeah. the menu anymore? That's my right. favorite. I come here for that dish. Right. Well, that's the You're caught in one. that bind, aren't you? Uh, well, especially at Stars because the menu changed every day. So I Whatever mean, you menu. found in the market? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but the power of the chef of, at that time meant that I could also introduce things to the world. For instance, it said, I can't remember if it's true, but it said that Stars was the first to introduce champagne by the glass, probably in California, not the United States. Mm -hmm. But someone would come to me, and I loved the wines at Malsas, and they told me we can't sell a drop in the United States, in California. Um, so I tasted them and put them on the menu, and I put them up on the mirror. I put them at the top of the menu. I did a special card for the table. I said, these are my favorite wines. Well, there was a market, you know, within a week they were selling cases of them. So that, so the celebrity uh, chef, that power actually could be put to wonderful things. Do you think you'd still be there if there hadn't been an earthquake? Oh, no, I would have had the sense to sell it long before. <laughs> it, actually, I sold it in 98 to a Chinese group, and then they ran it for two years and, and sold it. But, uh, you know, I had done restaurants for 35 years. That's like 70 years in other jobs. So, um, and Especially you know, if you're hours, a per perfectionist, and that's one of the things people claimed about you. Right. There's a certain obsession about uh, doing it well. I think we're... Like, like Tony and Lydia, vaccinated with making sure that everything's done right. And then you took off and went to Mexico? Yes. Well, I went to New York for a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to New York briefly and 9-11 happened, so I left New York and went to New Orleans and then Katrina happened, so I left New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> Earthquakes. And, and, and then I, so I ended up, I was actually attacks. on Cozumel when I got the news about Katrina and I realized, wow, I'm homeless and possessionless. I lost, you know, everything. I fortunately still had my checking account, but, you know, the rest was gone. So about 40 margaritas later, I thought, well, <laughs> uh, as, you know, as long as I'm on a tropical island, go for it. Now, we don't have the time to talk about what happened when you finally came back and worked at Tavern on the Green and the disaster right. that that was, but would it have been possible for any great chef to have kept to the standards that you've established for yourself in a restaurant that has 700 seats? No. Uh, <laughs> no. But I learned that lesson. <laughs> you, you thought you might be able to do it? Well, you know, I'm, no one ever said I didn't have a huge ego. <laughs> <laughs> and he does. <laughs> it's okay for me to say it, Lydia, not you. <laughs> Well, Jeremiah, I know of any number of restaurant spaces in New York that probably have 60 or 70 seats. Would yep. you consider? Uh, don't, they don't have tropical beaches. <laughs> <laughs> so you have moved to Mexico for good now? No, no. I mean, uh, you know, I might do a, a, a restaurant with Mario Batali on the Amalfi Coast. Hmm. I might take up that offer in Phuket to do a bar on the beach. That sounds heavenly, actually. Um, <laughs> And there, like, obviously, there's another movie in this, isn't there? <laughs> Magnificent Two: The Revenge. <laughs> <laughs> the re Jeremiah in a world. The Revenge. The revenge. In a world. I love that. I mean, but, I think he, you know, he is a Rolling Stone. I think he has been since, uh, you know, he was young. You know, he's his family traveled him everywhere, and I think he's. He doesn't like to lay down too many roots. I think this I mean. film is a lot of fun, not just for people who love food, but for people who are just interested in good stories about uh, 
what happened in the world over the last 50 or 60 years. And my great thanks to all of you for being on our show, this live broadcast that we've been doing from the green space with uh, Jeremiah Tower, Lydia Tenaglia, Anthony Bourdain, the film Jeremiah Tower, The Last Magnificent, opens tomorrow at the Sunshine Cinema. <laughs> And Andrew Tarlow and Anna Daum kick off our Spring Food Friday series on tomorrow's show. They'll talk about their book, Dinner at the Long Table, and about the challenges of hosting dinner parties in New York City. And then Nilu Mat Motomed, Food and Wine's editor-in-chief, will be joined by Angie Marr, one of the best new chefs in America, chosen by the magazine this year. Chef Sihui Kim and Ben Schneider, co-owners of the Good Fork Restaurant at Red Hook, will talk about working in a floodplain and their new cookbook, The Good Fork Cookbook, and our latest Please Explain is all about pies. The Leonard Lopez Show is produced by Andres O'Hara, Catherine Millsop, and Tofa Forges. Melissa Egan's executive producer, Matt Miranda, was at the audio controls. And we had help today from Deborah Freeman and contributing producers Barbara Kahn, Virginia Dave Doris, and Susie Stolls. I'm Leonard Lopez, your host. See you tomorrow.